Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And today is the 37th day since the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip launched a brutal war in Israel, committing a massacre resulting in thousands of casualties and 240 hostages. As we continue to update you from here in Jerusalem, let's immediately turn also to Mr. Amir Oren, our TV7 editor-at-large. Amir, could you please enlighten us, since there are new reports of uh, various casualties, uh, the, the numbers are fluctuating, what can you tell us about that? Yes, yeah, so we used to uh, talk uh, over the last uh, five weeks or so about 1,400 uh, Israelis and others uh, murdered by uh, the perpetrators. The uh, figures uh, might get to that total, but as of now, those confirmed dead uh, by murder, by massacre, um, are slightly more than 1,200, with um, some 80 plus uh, bodies yet to be identified, and more than 100 uh, considered missing. And uh, if you add all of that up, we may get uh, to 1,400. Now, what is happening uh, in the front or on the two fronts, on the uh, war of attrition with uh, Hezbollah on the Lebanese border and uh, the focus being uh, in the south uh, in Gaza? Apparently, the uh, Hamas uh, prepared and wanted Israel to fight it in the tunnels. Uh, the Israeli Defense Forces uh, have countered by, uh, at least up to now, fighting over ground, peeling away the uh, various defense rings of uh, the uh, uh, Hamas security compound, trying to be very careful not uh, to fall into the various uh, booby traps. It's not always successful. Israel uh, has suffered uh, very painful casualties, some 40 killed in action up to now in the south and uh, eight in the uh, north uh, with uh, many wounded uh, in action. Now, uh, just as uh, there is the visible uh, versus invisible dimensions um, in the war itself, there are those dimensions in the uh, diplomacy um, and negotiations regarding both a ceasefire and um, a hostage release deal. And um, because we can't rely on uh, confirmed information, we must await the announcement of uh, such a deal of some ceasefire um, against uh, a hostage release. Thank you uh, indeed, Mr. Oren. I'd like also immediately to turn to an undisclosed location where we're joined by the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, Brigadier General in Reserve, Doron Gavish. General Gavish, could you please provide us a operational update on the latest, particularly with focus on the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip? Yeah, uh, well, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Uh, and indeed, uh, Israeli ground forces are continuously enlarging their uh, uh, I would say, fight within the, the Gaza Strip, uh, mainly, of course, in the northern part of it, uh, surrounding uh, Gaza, and basically inside already uh, uh, Gaza. And we see the uh, the work that is being done very closely with the Air Force that, uh, from one hand, is continuously striking uh, Hamas targets, infrastructures, and uh, commanders, uh, tunnels, but also working in a very close support to the ground forces. Uh, we see the Air Force basically cleaning as explosives uh, and, and, uh, and areas uh, as a such which are in front of the Israeli forces, allowing them uh, to go in much uh, safer and, of course, uh, being designated by the ground forces uh, for uh, targets that are uh, relevant uh, to it, either commanders uh, or uh, terrorists that uh, are over there. So we, we see all of this continuously uh, going on uh, in the Gaza Strip. But alongside with it, we see also the corridors for humanitarian aid that the, aid that the, uh, that the Israeli Defense Forces are uh, opening for the civilians uh, in the Gaza Strip. We see that there are more than one and two uh, and three corridors uh, secured, heavily secured, uh, we should say, 
by the IDF because uh, the Hamas is doing everything that he can in order to stop those uh, civilians. Uh, they are shooting at them. They are uh, trying to put uh, barriers. Uh, and, and we talked about it more than once. The, the Hamas uh, just see those uh, uh, citizens as his uh, asset. He see them as, their, as his uh, human shields. And, uh, and it's quite amazing to see that the IDF, the Israeli forces, are doing everything uh, to allow those people to go to the safe zone uh, for to have uh, some uh, water supplies, medicines, and, and food. And the Hamas is the one who, who, is, who is trying to stop them. We see more and more uh, footages coming out of the West Bank of uh, the, the cynical way that the Hamas is using his uh, civilians and the rockets uh, that uh, the bunkers, which are very close to, to the hospitals, to school, uh, to governmental uh, uh, buildings and, and so on. Uh, we saw a few days ago the, the footages uh, that came out uh, of, of, a, of a, um, a house uh, that in one side we see the rooms of uh, three girls and the other side we see the Hamas manufacturing uh, rockets. So we see all these things uh, coming, uh, but I think that uh, overall we have to continue uh, saying that uh, Israel is very determined uh, on his mission, the IDF is very determined on his uh, mission to win this uh, war. Uh, in the last 24 hours, the IDF uh, Commander General Herzi Alevi was flying with a helicopter over the forces, talking with them, encouraging them, and also showing his respect to the professional uh, professionalism that they are showing in this uh, fight. Uh, we are taking our time. We are not rushing. Uh, we are doing everything very methodologic, uh, in a very metholo methodological uh, way. Uh, so I think this is something that we see. We also see still rockets that are uh, being shot by the Hamas uh, toward Israel. We should say that the numbers is, uh, are different from what we saw uh, two weeks ago. It's around 50 percent, but still uh, of what it was two weeks ago. But still, we see those rockets being uh, shot toward uh, Israel. They are still trying to terrorize our cities. They're, of course, they are not shooting on our military assets. They are directing their fires uh, uh, toward the, the civilians in, uh, in Israel. Thank you, General Gilgovish. But, but, of course, we should say that those rockets are being uh, uh, intercepted. Uh, the vast majority of them have been uh, intercepted by our air defense uh, forces uh, and the discipline of the Israeli population who is listening to the orders uh, that are issued by the on front command and going to the shelters. This is what allows us a very, very low uh, number of uh, Israeli civilians that were hit. Thank you, General Gavish. Let's join immediately by uh, a former uh, Israel Air Force pilot as well as commander uh, who is among the select few who participated in Operation Opera, in which the Iraqi nuclear reactor was struck in the early 80s by the Israeli Air Force, namely Brigadier General in Reserve Redik Shafir. Thank you for joining us, General. I'd like to hear your insight on the latest developments vis-a-vis -vis the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. Uh, there are obviously uh, reports, including the official announcement uh, by the IDF that Hamas has lost control of the northern part of the enclave. Is that indeed so? And if so, what are the implications thereof? I think that using the word uh, does not control um, is a verbiage that, that should be looked at. What, what does it mean, control? It may not be able to shoot as accurately or as timely as it wanted to. But uh, as long as they're active underground, they're able to communicate, send commands to other parts, uh, we can't say that they're out of control. Um, there is a uh, equilibrium between the speed that the uh, Israeli army and Air Force are advancing on the one hand, and the number of casualties on the Israeli side and civilians. Um, so this very delicate matter means that uh, we want to reduce the number of uh, our casualties, reduce the number of civilians, which means opening uh, humanitarian gates for civilians to go south um, and very carefully 
planting munitions or disabling the uh, underground um, uh, tunnel system without demolishing, for instance, the uh, Al-Shifa hospital, without causing an international uproar. So this is a very delicate equilibrium for the uh, military to keep, uh, taking in mind all the different uh, pressure points, um, both from the Israeli public, international uh, public, uh, international leaders and their pressures. So the rate and also uh, the fog of war uh, is such that we can't really tell what is going on down there. Uh, but um, haste, as they say, brings waste. So I think this is a very careful operation by the Israeli uh, military uh, to reach those uh, to gain uh, control without losing a grip on what is going on and uh, uh, reducing the number of casualties. So uh, I say I would say that this is the crux of the matter at this time. Thank you, Gen uh, uh, General Shafil. Uh, Mr. Jonathan, if I if I may share some observations, uh, which do. um, dovetail overlap with uh, what uh, General Shafir just said, um, having visited uh, one of the um, control uh, centers, the nerve centers, where um, the officers are scrutinizing each and every target um, situated in a civilian uh, vicinity. So um, in 1991, uh, when Saddam Hussein uh, tried to respond to what uh, General Shafir and his uh, seven brothers in arms did to him 10 years earlier, Israel uh, was divided uh, into only six zones. It was as if um, considered that you are in New Jersey shooting, uh, launching missiles at New York City and uh, when it passes uh, through Manhattan, the entire borough hears the sirens. Now it has been perfected to uh, uh, such uh, an art where only a tiny sliver of each borough um, would be given an alert. And the same goes to the offense when um, the uh, Israeli joint fires are directed at um, a piece of real estate in Gaza it is only uh, a few blocks which would be targeted so that uh, the population will not uh, be hurt uh, outside of it. And uh, it's the sort of a traffic light pattern where if you have uh, a majority, uh, a great majority of uh, people who are still there, it's red. If uh, most of them left, it's green. And if it's 50-50, uh, it's yellow or amber. So uh, people take very seriously both the moral, legal, and operational constraints before they uh, authorize uh, a strike, be it from a, a fighter plane, um, a helicopter, uh, a UAV, a gun, or um, a missile boat. Thank you, Mr. Owen. Uh, very important remarks indeed. Israel operates within the boundaries of international law and the laws of war, and therefore it is acting uh, accordingly, as uh, Mr. Owen just uh, illustrated. Uh, General Kavisha, I'd like to hear from uh, your perspective. The Northern Front has been uh, escalating uh, quite uh, uh, significantly in recent days, and, and we see that uh, it is inching uh, every day closer into a, a full-scale uh, conflagration. And therefore, I'd, I'd like to hear from you the latest operational update on, on uh, the complexities at hand. Also, from the IDF's perspective, uh, we noted on a number of occasions already the fact that uh, while we do have a very strong contingent of IDF ground troops along the borders ready to uh, retaliate or to absorb any kind of uh, attack uh, by Hezbollah and its uh, affiliates. Uh, at the same time, more than half of uh, the Israeli Air Force is prepared offensively to retaliate in full. Uh, and to retaliate in force, obviously, would bring devastation uh, to Lebanon, uh, which, unfortunately, we, we don't want to see 
materialize. Nevertheless, uh, this uh, tumor that has grown for too long and nobody has uh, truly cared for, uh, taking it out uh, in time, uh, has spread out throughout uh, much of Lebanon, and, and unfortunately it is threatening not only Israel but adjacent other adjacent countries. Uh, what is your take on the latest? Well, first of all, you're right uh, on your uh, observation, uh, Jonathan. And uh, by the way, unfortunately, a few hours ago, we saw uh, uh, a missile uh, that was uh, attacking uh, six civilians uh, of uh, our electricity company that were uh, working in the northern uh, part of Israel. And they were injured, uh, one of them uh, severely injured. And uh, the other unit that was trying to shoot an anti-tank uh, rocket or the missile toward Israel was uh, encountered uh, before they, they even uh, did it. So, yes, we, we see it uh, happening again and again uh, from the northern uh, arena. There is a low-level uh, fight, uh, which we are not in a, in a full war uh, scale, but, but the fight is there. Uh, we see missiles that uh, are uh, rockets, sorry, that are being shot uh, from there a few days. Uh, we saw a long-range uh, rocket. Uh, we saw some UAVs and then, as we said, the anti-tank uh, units. Of course, on the tactic level, we have to say that uh, the Israeli Air Force, the, the IDF uh, overall, is encountering uh, the vast majority of uh, those uh, rockets, uh, UAVs and anti-tanks that are being uh, shot uh, Israel. The, the Hezbollah have more than 70 um, terrorists that were uh, killed, but we are mainly looking uh, uh, toward the, the north, and uh, we are very alert uh, for this uh, situation that uh, if this would uh, escalate to a, a full war, and, and here you are, you are very right. Uh, Israel uh, recruited, as we remember, more than uh, 300,000 uh, reserve, majority of them are being deployed uh, toward the south. The Israeli Air Force uh, uh, you said 50%, it's even more than that, that uh, is uh, now aiming uh, toward, uh, uh, to the north in a, in a very, very, uh, very, I would say, uh, short alert. And uh, if uh, Nasrallah and Hezbollah would miscalculate and uh, we start a full war toward Israel, uh, and the, the Israeli Air Force is fully ready uh, to, to, to launch a vast, a uh, strike which uh, would be a very, very strong uh, uh, attack uh, toward the, the Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon. So uh, everyone is, is really ready. And we have to say also that uh, the IDF and the Israeli Air Force and the Air Defense is ready and alert uh, not only toward the, the north, uh, because uh, we saw some uh, UAVs coming from uh, Syria. We saw missiles that were uh, launched from uh, the Red Sea. Uh, so we are uh, in, in, in all of those were uh, intercepted or the vast majority of them was uh, intercepted that there was a UAV that did head, hit a school in, uh, in uh, Elat, but uh, the other UAV was intercepted. And of course, all those missiles that came from the Red Sea were also intercepted by the Arrow 2 and the Arrow 3. Uh, applying the full multi-tier uh, defense system uh, of Israel. So we are alert uh, through the, the north, but not only through the north. We are alert basically uh, 360 uh, degrees. Thank you, General Gavish. Uh, General Shafir, I'd like to hear your take on this. It's We heard also last night Prime Minister B. Netanyahu speak about uh, what uh, General Gavish just noted on the regional activities undertaken by the Israeli Defense Forces, but also particularly with regard to Lebanon, uh, when uh, Defense Minister Yav Gallant, who formerly served also as a major general in the, the IDF, uh, was asked about what is the red line for Israel, since we do see today, uh, General Gavish noted already, the, the six civilians, including one in critical condition, and uh, just yesterday, uh, two uh, separate strikes uh, by Hezbollah operatives uh, have brought about uh, the four casualties, including uh, all four of them, IDF soldiers in critical condition, some of them. Uh, it, it raises questions about this, and uh, General uh, or Defense Minister Yav Gallant mentioned uh, that uh, he's not going to mention what the red line is, but it is nearing. 
and that uh, we will know exactly when uh, we will wake up to uh, uh, the reports of aerial strikes taking place in Beirut. So uh, do you see this as a imminent challenge that may indeed occur in the event of miscalculation by Hezbollah? No, as uh, you may know, uh, maybe our viewers may be aware that uh, this particular minister that we were mentioning uh, was um, reported to be uh, in favor of opening a northern front and doing uh, away once and for all with Hezbollah with their threats um, and uh, using this opportunity. Um, this is uh, something that should be taken no a note of that there are some uh, who uh, think that uh, this is a chance to wrap up what's happening with Hezbollah in Iran at this particular time when we have public opinion on our side, at least from leaders. And uh, there is no doubt that in order for the uh, in, uh, people who had uh, relocated from the north, we're talking about 60 to 100,000 uh, inhabitants in the north, they will not go back unless uh, Hezbollah is removed from the border. Now, if this doesn't happen during this particular uh, part of the conflict, uh, what will convince them to go back? So there's a lot of uh, pressure within Israel to do something, um, maybe a ground operation, maybe an air force operation to uh, uh, push Hezbollah militants uh, up to the Litani River, river at least, an area that can be guarded, uh, or uh, even going through a full-scale confrontation with Hezbollah uh, as a showdown. So uh, I would say that uh, the decision is not only in Nasrallah's hand. He may have done enough to convince enough Israelis and decision makers, and maybe also uh, uh, the United States, that uh, this would be a good time to confront uh, Nasrallah. So um, I think the situation in that uh, uh, manner is shaky. Shaky is a term that should be used by people who are worried about whether it should happen. But it is also an opportunity by other people. So um, it's uh, a precarious, to say the least, situation at this time unpredictability is obviously not something you want to contend with but uh, as uh, general shafir noted uh, both idf chief of general staff lieutenant general helsia levy and yoav galant the israeli minister of defense both uh, did recommend according to various reports uh, that uh, Israel would launch a preemptive strike against Hezbollah and then obviously other Iranian proxies uh, on the northern front. But uh, let's turn also to Mr. Oren, since uh, there are various complexities at hand that Israel does need to take into account, and, and those complexities remain. The hostages. Uh, where is this standing? You noted earlier in today's update that uh, we won't know until something actually happens, but we do know that the Mossad is heavily engaged under the leadership of David Barnea, uh, its director, uh, in uh, uh, various diplomatic channels vis-à-vis uh, -vis Qatar, vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Egypt and other uh, regional and global actors also to try and pressure Hamas into succumbing uh, to release uh, those uh, hostages currently in its uh, captivity. The uh, conductor of this orchestra seems to be William Burns, the director of the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, um, who is a master of the back channel. This is also um, the title of his uh, book, uh, a book he wrote before he uh, came back into government after he retired from the uh, State Department. And uh, he has a lot of experience in uh, conducting uh, secret negotiations with uh, Iran and the other players in the region, through Oman, through Qatar, and others. And obviously, it's a question of uh, price, of uh, sequencing, of timing. Um, and uh, what it uh, may come down to is the Israeli agreement to cease fire, at least 
for the time being, for a couple of days, while this is being done, while some of the hostages are being transferred from one part of Gaza to another part until they are given over to a third party, party such as Egypt, on the way to Israel. Israel releases uh, prisoners in its jails. Uh, this too is a complicated process because by Israeli law, the families of the victims of those prisoners um, who were convicted of murder, for instance, can appeal to the high court against the release of these prisoners. So it may take time. And during this time, uh, Hamas insists that Israel holds its fire. Now, for Israel, uh, this may not be such a burden because uh, Israel, too, may want to refresh some of the forces in Gaza to let them leave uh, for a while, go home for a weekend or so, come back. And the only uh, condition or two conditions would be, first of all, that there would be no standstill, that the forces would, could still advance. And if shot at, fire back. And the other condition is that ceasefire is going to be seized sometime, uh, two days from now, three days. But eventually that Israel could renew its counteroffensive without being charged with violating the agreement. If that's acceptable, we will see an agreement uh, where some 100 or 120 civilians, mostly uh, women and minors, are being exchanged on each side. Thank you, Mr. Oren. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank, once again, Mr. Oren, General Kavish, and uh, General Shafir for taking out of your times to update us on the latest. I'd like also to thank all of you at home. I'd like also to take this opportunity to once again call on you if uh, you are in tune with the situation and understand also the complexities of international diplomacy. Your phone call, your message, your email to your representative, to your government official will make a difference. And therefore, I encourage you to do so if possible, of course. And uh, also, TV7 Israel is a donation-based ministry. Therefore, if you're blessed by our productions, your support is truly instrumental in keeping those updates alive. And therefore, I'd like to encourage you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com, where you will be able to uh, support us with a donation. From here in Jerusalem, until our next update, shalom. I'm Eran Etzion, former Deputy National Security Advisor here in Israel, a diplomat, a strategist by training. I'm very happy to be at TV7 and offer my interpretation along my esteemed colleagues. The uh, strong point of TV7 is to be a reliable source of authoritative insight in an era of shallow news environment that is very difficult for viewers to trust.